Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome once again to our midweek Bible study on this evening. I'm Brother Eura Miles, and I'll be standing in for Pastor Davis on this evening. Amen. As always, let's please continue to pray for Pastor Davis and Sister Davis while they are away. We want to ask God to continue to use them for his glory and then that he will keep them safe from dangers, both seen and unseen, and then that he will give them traveling grace safely back home. Uh, do we have a volunteer soloist or ensemble for a song tonight? Sister Darian Darrington for that rendition. Now I put that in because I knew nobody would be here to uh, volunteer for my solo. And look what God has done. <laughs> I'm waiting on you, brother, to join in. <laughs> he, br he brought us a, a soloist. <laughs> so thank you, Sister Darrington. You are welcome. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we bless your name today. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. We thank you, dear Master, for watching over us and keeping us safe from all harm and danger, from this morning's early rising to this evening, dear Master, and the setting of the sun. Lord, we praise you. We lift you up and magnify your name. Yes, Lord, we ask now that you would bless us as we come together for Bible study, Lord. We ask that you would let your word go forth, dear Master, and that you would teach us what we need to know from this Bible study lesson. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless Pastor and Sister Davis, be with them while they are away. Lord, bless each and every member of the New Beginning Church. We pray not only for the person in the sanctuary, but for our online presence as well. Lord, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So, our lesson today is titled, Knowing What Man of Spirit We Are. And that title really just comes from uh, one of our verses that's uh, in the lesson, which Luke 9, verse 55. But he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit ye are of. And let's just keep that in mind because I may or may not get to tie that in as we, as we teach the lesson, but let's just keep that thought in mind. You know not what manner of spirit you are. Uh, Let's begin by reading our scriptures for tonight, beginning with Luke chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them the power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Verse 3, And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread nor money, neither take two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide and thence depart. And whosoever shall not receive you, when you go out of the, that city, shake the dust, take off the very dust from your feet, for a testimony against them. 
Then we skip to Luke 9 and 10, which says, And the apostles, when they returned, told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. Then we skip down to verse 51. So then it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent, and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went another, into another village. So tonight's lesson excerpted from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. According to tradition, Luke was a Gentile, and Paul seems to confirm this in Colossians chapter 4, when he makes a distinction between those who are of the circumcision and Luke. And he also indicates that Luke was a doctor or a physician. Luke's Gospel, along with Acts, appears to be intended mostly for a Gentile audience. He uses Greek terminology instead of Hebrew. He identifies locations in Israel that will be familiar to all Jews, but not necessarily to a Gentile audience. He uses a minimal number of Old Testament quotes. And when he does quote the Old Testament, he quotes it from an early Greek translation of the Hebrew text. The Gospel of Luke chronicles the history of Christianity from the birth of John the Baptist to Christ's ascension into heaven. He particularly highlights Jesus' comparisons, Jesus' compassion towards the outcast, towards the downtrodden, towards Gentiles, towards Samaritans, towards women, towards children, towards tax collectors, and sinners. As a physician, Luke also highlights Jesus' ministry of healing. Chapter 8 of the Gospel of Luke is really a power-packed chapter with Jesus preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. Chapter 8 contains such notable passages as the parable of the sower, it, the parable of a lamp on a lampstand. It has his declaration to his, that his mother and his brothers are those who, who hear God's word and put it into practice. He calms the storm by rebuking the winds and the waves. He heals a demon-possessed man. He heals a woman with an issue of blood. And to bring that chapter to a close, he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. Now, when we go to chapter 9 of Luke's gospel, Jesus' earthly ministry is in full swing. He is on his third tour of the area in and around Galilee. Jesus has been preaching the kingdom of God, and he's been demonstrating the power of God through many signs and wonders. His disciples have been eyewitnesses to these things. So now he starts to prepare his disciples for his departure. As he sets his focus on Jerusalem to fulfill the purpose for which he came into the world, he now commissions them to trans transition from simply being observers of the miracles that he performed to practitioners of them themselves. It would be their responsibility to carry on the work after his departure. So in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, he says, Then he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And then he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. 
There then here simply refers to what happened earlier in Luke's narrative. We don't know the time frame between chapter 8 and chapter 9, but all of the things that happened earlier in Luke's narrative and then the beginning and the beginning here of chapter 9. So Jesus called them together and his, it says his 12 disciples, which means his 12 pupils or his 12 learners. Now, this is late in Jesus' ministry. At this point, does he only have 12 disciples? Okay. No, he has many disciples. <laughs> he has many disciples, many followers. The term disciple and apostle are sometimes used interchangeably. But he has this 12 apostles, but he has many disciples who are now following him. The 12 here refers to the 12 disciples that he has called out to be apostles. Luke 6, 12 through 16 tells us that Jesus went up into a mountain and prayed all night long. And when it was day, he called his disciples to him, and out of them he chose 12. That 12 is who he named apostles. Now, Bible scholars, how many of that 12 can you name? Don't tell me none. Peter. Okay, we got Peter. Any others? Andrew. Okay, Andrew. Who was Andrew? Oh, he was Peter's brother. Okay, that, that's all we can get. Peter. Okay. 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 All right, so that passage names them. Now, some of the names are different in different passages of Scripture. That passage from Luke names them as Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, and Bartholomew, who I believe is the same one as Nathaniel or Thaddeus, one of those, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, the brother of James, and some translations say the son of James. The text doesn't read brother or son. It reads Judas of James. So the translators speculate as to what that relationship is. And then there's Judas Iscariot, and which Luke notes, which also was the traitor. Well, these apostles are chosen from among all of Jesus' disciples, and they're given by him power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. The Greek word for power that's translated here is dynamis, spelled dynamis, and pronounced dunamis. It's where we get the root word for the English word for dynamite. It means the power that's inherent in a thing by nature. A stick of dynamite has something in, in it by nature because it's dynamite. If you light the fuse, it unleashes that power. It means Something, a power which a person or a thing then exerts or puts forth, such as the power to perform miracles. That's what Jesus imparted to his disciples. The word that's translated as authority is another Greek word for power. That word is exousia. It is the power of authority. It gives one the freedom or the privilege to act, to judge, and to make decisions. In human terms, a law enforcement officer, the badge of a law enforcement officer is his exousia authority, his badge. That lets you know that he's to enforce the law. He has, he's authorized to enforce the law. His badge is 
an example of his exousia authority. But his dunamis power is found in the barrel of his gun and his taser. <laughs> That's what he uses <laughs> to exert that power that he's authorized to use. So Jesus here sends them out to preach the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the good news that the long-awaited Messiah has come. The one who would occupy the throne of David forever has come. Now, Jesus was not what the people expected, but he's here. The 12 apostles are now called to go out and to tell it. They were not sent, they were not only sent to preach, but they were also sent to do good as well. They were to provide relief for the suffering people, people who were suffering physically and people who were suffering spiritually as well. The call was to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, please note that Jesus called the 12 and he sent them out to preach and to teach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. <coughs> but before he called them to the task at hand, he equipped them for the task. He gave them the power to do what he called them to do. And he gave them the authority or the right to exercise that power. Now that's a spiritual principle that we ought to part deep into our souls today. What God calls us to do, he also equips us to do. And when he equips us, he also empowers us to be able to do it. He doesn't send us out to fail for the lack of power and for the lack of authority. When he calls us to a task, it may not even be obvious that he's already equipped us, but he has. And what we have to do is to trust and obey that he has equipped us when he calls us. And we need to just go forth and see what God is going to do in the mission that he's called us to. In verse 3, Jesus now gives specific instructions as to how they are to travel. He says, keep it light, keep it simple. Jesus says, don't take your staff, don't take your walking stick with you. Don't take your leather traveling bag, your script. Don't take any food. Don't take any money to buy food. And don't even take a change of clothes. Now, Jesus is sending them out with nothing. But these instructions kind of coincide with Jewish custom that would have been familiar to these disciples because there were customs that forbid anyone from entering the temple with a staff, with shoes, or with a money bag. They did, didn't want to even give the appearance that they were there for anything but worship. They didn't want anyone to even think that they were conducting business in the temple, on the temple grounds. So likewise, Jesus' disciples are now sent out with nothing so that they can be laser focused on the mission that he sent, sent them out to. Also, going out with nothing, they had to trust God. They had to trust the God who called them and then empowered them to provide for them along the way. In verse 4, he tells them, whatsoever house you enter, there abide, and thence depart. Go there, and don't go to another house until it's time to go. What he's telling them is, is that don't come to Brother Miles little shack <laughs> and start warming your feet by my fire and look across the street and see Whitlock Manor and decide, well, looks better over there. <laughs> it's bigger, it's brighter. They probably got softer couches, everything. And so then look at me and go, thanks, bro. Deuces. <laughs> Jesus, don't do that. Don't make this thing personal. Don't 
Do things that benefit yourself as you go out. The person who shows you the hospitality when you first arrive, accept their hospitality and live with that. Keep focused on the mission. And then he tells them, and whosoever will not receive you when you go out into that city, he says, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. Whoever does not welcome you or show hospitality, don't make a scene, don't flip out, don't give them a holy beat down in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Just do what you normally do when you leave a Gentile city. That was the pattern when they left a Gentile city. They didn't want to take the dust of the Gentile city back home with them. So they take off their shoes and shake the dust off of their feet. He tells them to do that same thing with these Jewish brethren who do not accept the message that you came that came to deliver, who do not offer you the hospitality that is customary. This gesture is kind of like the time when the Iranian person showed his displeasure with George Bush by taking off his shoe and hurling it at him <laughs> as, a sign, as, a sign, as a sign of disrespect. Let's make a note here of how Jesus tells these apostles to deal with rejection. They are to handle it in a passive and in a quiet manner. So leave the ones who reject the kingdom and those <clears throat> who leave the ones who reject the kingdom to the one who sent you. Don't try to enforce things yourself. Don't take vengeance out on them, on them yourself. If someone rejects you or fails to show you hospitality, basically, thank you for your time. <laughs> Have a nice day and move on. <clears throat> now, that's the way he tells them to deal with rejection. Okay, we move on to verse 10, and verse 10 just covers when they came back from this mission. When the apostles returned, they told Jesus all that he had done. Luke now calls them by their proper name, apostles. In chapter 9 and 1, he called them the 12 disciples, even though they had already been named as apostles. Perhaps now, since they've been sent out and returned, They've been initiated or ordained into this specific calling to be an apostle. Now, can you imagine how excited, how exciting it must have been for these 12 who had seen Jesus perform all these miracles throughout his ministry? And now they went out, then the first time they laid hands on someone and they were healed, or the first time that they told a demon to get up out of here and the demon had to flee, they must have <clears throat> been overjoyed with excitement that they would be able to do similar things to what Jesus had done. So when they returned, now Jesus took them aside privately into a desert place. He possibly wanted to have them to have some downtime, to decompress. But he took them... <clears throat> off to themselves, maybe to get their heart rates back down to normal after all they had seen and all they had heard. But whatever quiet time they sought didn't last very long because the multitudes found out where they were and <clears throat> they came and followed. And when they arrived, Jesus received them. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God and he healed their diseases as well. In the verses between where we are now and the end of our lesson, Jesus feeds the multitude, he feeds the 5,000. Peter responds correctly to the question of who do men, who do you say that I am? Uh, he <clears throat> informs them of the true nature of his mission, that he was going to be killed and raised again the third day. He also is transfigured 
before Peter, James, and John. And then he heals a demon-possessed boy who his disciples were unable to cast out. And then he declares that whoever will come to him must first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. When we get all the way down to verse 51, it says that when the time came for Jesus to be received up, meaning that the time for him to return to the Father who sent him was rapidly approaching, it says that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus knew that the time was drawing near. So he had a heightened focus on the remaining task at hand. His return trip was not going to be, his return trip to the Father was not going to be a matter of buying a plane ticket and flying off. His road home was going to be through the cross. He came to die for the sins of the world. Jesus knew that agony awaited him. Isaiah speaks prophetically of this moment in Isaiah 50 and 7 when he says, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Flint is a hard, hard stone that they use to, to spark fires, to sharpen knives. And he says that, that he set his face like flint so that he would not be ashamed. In verse 52, it says that Jesus sent messengers before ahead of him to make arrangements for their hospitality in a Samaritan village. Verse 53, but when the Samaritans learned that his destination was Jerusalem, they refused to grant him hospitality. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked Jesus, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? When James and John saw this, they wanted to retaliate. Lord, do you want us to do this? They had a problem with the Samaritans disrespecting Jesus. You know, there was already always issues between the Jews and the Samaritans. And these Samaritans had the nerve to not extend this hospitality to Jesus. Now, these boys, James and John, had been out on the mission field. They had been granted power and authority by Jesus Christ. They were not going to stand for anybody disrespecting Jesus. They were ready to rumble. Lord, do you want us to do what Elijah did? To just call down fire from heaven and wipe them all out? And that what he's talking about is in 2 Kings 1, 9 through 16. Now, they forgot all of Jesus' instructions earlier about what to do to those who reject. Shake the dust off and move on. They had another plan. <laughs> they wanted to fight. Now, in reading this passage, you know, Peter gets a well-deserved bad rap. Because many times he puts his foot in his mouth. Mm -hmm. He speaks too soon. He says the wrong thing. But these other two, James and John, of his inner circle, there's something else as well. They had sought the choice places in the kingdom. They wanted to outmaneuver the other disciples where one of them would sit on God's, Jesus' right hand in the kingdom, and the other would sit on his left. They went behind the other disciples' back to try to secure those spots. Now, they also wanted to make some folks stop casting out demons in Jesus' name. Lord, they're out there casting out demons, and they're not with us. You want us to go put a stop to that? Jesus said, leave them alone. If they're not against us, then they're for us. If they can cast out demons, 
That's good work. Let, let them just continue. And so now they want to burn some folks up. No wonder Jesus nicknamed James and John the sons of thunder. They were some, some pretty uh, characters themselves. And this is, this is our guy, John, too. <laughs> the beloved disciple, John. But they had some growing to do. So in verse 55, it says that Jesus turned and rebuked them. Rebuked James, rebuked John, and he says, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. You don't know the spirit that you're called to. He says, this thing you're called to is not a vengeful spirit. It's not one that you take revenge on persons. The scripture says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and I will repay. And then he goes on in 56 and says, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but he came to save them. And then they went into another village. <clears throat> Jesus says, just take the passive approach and move on. James and John really didn't know who they were in the kingdom. They didn't know themselves. Maybe they thought they were helping God, going to help God, do him a favor. They thought they were going to be like God and just exercise complete authority and complete control over the Samaritans. But God, Jesus came to save people like those Samaritans, not to destroy them. The actions that they wanted to take didn't represent the heart of God. God loved the Samaritans just like he loved the Israelites, and he wanted them also to repent and to be saved. James and John were still unclear on Jesus' mission. He came to save the lost, not to burn them up with fire from heaven. Following <coughs> Jesus means being merciful to others instead of being harsh to them. Especially, we should remember the vengeance is mine. God reserves that for himself. The disciples of Christ who died for God's enemies who should never think about avenging themselves against persecutors. When God blesses us and saves us and gives us power, we're called upon to use that power wisely. Mm -hmm. We must be able to recognize what kind of spirit we are of. Our reaction should not be as the world's reaction. Our response should not be as the world's response. Now, we should never be the instigator of a road rage incident. <laughs> If someone cuts us off in the traffic, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be the one, we shouldn't be the one. Nope. cutting them off and cursing them and giving them the finger, all that kind of stuff. We have to recognize of what spirit we are of. Why you look at Brother Whitlock, Sister Whitlock? <laughs> do I guess I wasn't supposed to see that. But. <laughs> Our reaction should not be like the world's, and our response should not be like the world's. What we should do is what Jesus would do and what he has commanded us to do. Shake the dust off and move on. God bless you. Are there any questions or comments this, this evening? Amen. Amen. All right. No questions, no comments. Either we got it or... We didn't get it. I'll go back and read. Okay. Amen. So now if you have been streaming our Bible study and you don't know this Jesus whom we speak of, the one who came to seek and to save the lost, you can be introduced to him on this day at this very hour. 
Jesus came and died for the sins of the world. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of God's glory. And the only way for us to get into heaven and to spend eternity with God is to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And you can do so by praying this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Now if you pray that prayer with a sincere heart, the Bible says that you are now saved, that you are now part of the family of God, and that you will be able to spend eternity in the presence of God. If you committed to Jesus Christ this evening for the first time, we ask that you please inbox us at lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Introduce yourself to us so that we can introduce ourselves to you and send you some more information about your new life in Christ. Uh, we've got a couple of announcements here, and then we will be dismissed. Our standard announcement is that if you would like to contribute financially to the ministry of the New Beginning Church, you may do so in one of two ways. Via Zelle at the email address of lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, or you may send your contribution by the mail to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77. Four five nine. We ask that you please join us again on Sunday morning for Sunday school at 9 a.m. and morning worship service at 10.30 a.m. Thank you for joining us this evening. God bless you. Be blessed.